Hello, this is Dr. Benjamin Norris from the Chemistry Department at Frostburg State University. Today we're going to talk about NMR spectroscopy, focusing on carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy. Carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy shares a lot of similarities to hydrogen or proton NMR spectroscopy. Uh, the carbon-13 nucleus has a spin, it responds to magnetic fields, and the difference in energy between those spin states can be probed by, probed by radio wave radiation. But there are some important differences as well. Uh, one is in the chemical shift range. Hydrogen and NMR uh, spectra typically have a chemical shift range between 0 and 13 parts per million relative to tetramethylsilane. Tetramethylsilane is uh, still the chemical shift standard for carbon-13 NMR spectra, but the chemical shift range is much broader in carbon-13 NMR. It goes from 0 to 220 parts per million. Uh, but what is similar is that even though the, the range is broader, the chemical shift is still characteristic of those chemical environments for, for the carbon atoms in the molecule. Here's an example of how those two things are different. Uh, the hydrogen NMR spectrum of octane is shown on the left, and you only see two peaks. And we see only see two peaks because the uh, all of the interior hydrogen atoms in octane collapse together because their chemical shifts are very similar. Uh, but because the chemical shift range in a carbon spectrum is much broader, even things that have very similar chemical shifts can show up as distinct peaks. And so you will usually see peaks for all types of carbon atoms in a carbon and a marsh spectrum, where maybe you, some hydrogen atoms will overlap in the hydrogen and a marsh spectrum. Uh, second difference has to do with solvents. In a hydrogen and a marsh spectrum, we can replace the hydrogen atoms with deuteriums in the solvent so that the solvent peaks don't show up. Um, however, these deuterated solvents still have carbon atoms in them. And we'll see in a minute why getting all of the carbon-13 out is actually tough. Uh, we continue to use deuterated solvents um, and, and you'll see in a minute why, uh, or you'll see right now why, the, because deuterium is NMR active, so the solvent peaks are split into weird things. Um, deuterium has three spin states, plus one, zero, and minus one, where, where hydrogen only has two spin states that basically up and down. Deuterium has up, down, and sort of sideways. Uh, so because there are three spin states, things are split into threes instead of twos, uh, and that overall splitting patterns can get complicated quickly. But the deuterium-oriented splitting is different than anything you might see anywhere else in the spectrum, so it's really easy to pull out the solvent peaks when you see them. A third difference between carbon and hydrogen in NMR spectroscopy is in the abundance of all, or of carbon, 13. Carbon-13 is 1.1% of all carbon atoms, where proton, or protium, uh, hydrogen-1, is 99.9% .9 of all hydrogen atoms. So carbon-13 is already at a disadvantage because only about 1% of all carbon atoms are carbon-13. In addition, the NMR signal from carbon-13 is less intense because carbon-13 has a smaller magnetogyric radius. Um, it interacts less strongly with magnetic fields. So overall, the signal strength from a C13 sample is 1 hundredth the signal strength from a hydrogen sample of the same concentration. Uh, usually we get around this particular issue by taking, by using longer acquisition times. So if we continue to take the same spectrum over and 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 add them all up, the signals that are generated by the carbon atoms continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, but the, the signals that might be generated by random fluctuations or noise get smaller and smaller and smaller or, or cancel themselves out because they're random. Uh, a truly dedicated organic chemist with only a tiny amount of a very precious compound might spend four or eight hours collecting a reasonable quality carbon-13 NMR spectrum. A fourth difference is that there's no carbon-carbon coupling in carbon NMR spectrum. 
Remember that carbon-13 represents only 1.1% of all carbon atoms. So statistically, not even every molecule has a, a carbon-13 nucleus in it to begin with. Um, for example, toluene, which has seven carbon atoms, only one in 13 toluene molecules has one carbon-13 nucleus. And so the likelihood that you have two carbon-13 nuclei in a molecule is, is real and calculable. So it's one in every 13 squared. So every one in 169 molecules has two. But then the likelihood that they are neighboring to each other. So if you do happen to have two carbon-13 nuclei in the same molecule neighboring each other, splitting will occur. But the statistical likelihood of that is so rare that it can't be picked up by most instruments. And so it's not observable. Another difference between carbon and hydrogen MR is the presence of carbon-hydrogen coupling. Uh, hydrogen, of course, is NMR active and it has its different spin states and so carbon spectra can, you know, carbon spectra are split by the hydrogen atoms that are attached to those carbon atoms. The reason why we don't see carbon-hydrogen splitting in hydrogen NMR spectra has to do with the rarity of carbon-13. If only, you know, if only 1% of all of the hydrogen peaks have carbon-13s in them, then you're not going to see carbon-hydrogen splitting. It is in fact possible if you take a hydrogen spectrum and collect thousands of scans over a long time period at a very high concentration, you will eventually be able to see tiny little carbon-hydrogen peaks for the, the C13 in the sample but generally it's hard to observe. But in carbon, where every carbon-13 is being picked up and most of them have hydrogens on them, you can see carbon-hydrogen splitting. The problem is, quantum mechanically, the splitting can occur not just with the hydrogen atoms that are directly attached to that carbon, but also hydrogen atoms that are up to three bonds away. So that means that the splitting patterns that a particular carbon atom can have would be really obnoxious to the point of uninterpretable. And so most carbon-13 spectra are decoupled. This means that broadband radio pulses are used to keep the proton spins constantly flipping so that their effect on the local magnetic field around those carbon atoms is, you know, averages out to zero. There are two different types of, of decoupling. One is broadband decoupling where all carbon signals appear as singlets. There's also something called off-resonance decoupling that manages to make the multiplicity of the carbon peaks dependent only on the one bond CH coupling. In other words, the, the number of hydrogen atoms directly bond to that carbon and nothing else. So methane CH4 would appear as a quintet, methyl groups as a quartet, methylene CH2s as a triplet, methines CH groups as a doublet, and carbons with no hydrogen atoms would appear as singlets. The final difference between carbon and hydrogen NMR comes in integration. Carbon NMR spectra are often not integrated because the intensity of carbon peaks are dependent on more factors than just the number of carbon atoms. So while the peaks are predominantly dependent upon the number of carbon atoms responsible for that peak, they are also dependent on the number uh, or the hybridization of those carbon atoms responsible for that peak where sp3 hybridized carbon atoms are a little bit more intense than sp2 hybridized carbon atoms than sp hybridized carbon atoms and the reason for that is that the carbon atoms with different hybridizations have different what are called relaxation times and that takes it actually takes some time once you flip to the spin of a carbon atom from one to one state to another for it to relax back into its, its original state and those numbers are different for different types of carbon atoms in, in different bonding situations. Uh, and if you're not careful, you could start collecting the next scan of data before all of the carbon atoms have relaxed back into their other states. And so things are artificially smaller because of that. And then finally, the number of hydrogen atoms directly attached to that carbon can also mess with its integration. CH4 peaks appear taller than CH3s, appear taller than CH2s, appear taller than CHs, appear taller than carbons with no hydrogen atoms. And this is due to something called the nuclear Overhauser effect, where some 
spin transfer, some energy transfer occurs from the spin flipping hydrogens to the carbons. So that it appears they are absorbing and emitting more radio frequency energy than, than they actually are. That last particular one can be useful if, if used deliberately, but that's a topic for an advanced course in NMR spectroscopy. Some things, however, are reliably similar to between the two types of, of NMR spectroscopy. For one thing, the number of peaks uh, is pretty reliably related to the structure of a molecule, and you can predict the number of carbon atoms or the number of different types of carbon atoms that would generate the number of different types of peaks, again based on the symmetry of a molecule. Carbon atoms can be chemically equivalent, homotopic, and antiotopic, etc. And so here are four constitutional isomers uh, arranged based on the number of peaks, and the number of peaks that are generated by these isomers has to do with the level of symmetry within the structure. So ethyl benzene has six peaks, uh, orthoxylene has four, M-xylene has five and paraxylene has three. Uh, and the reason that the numbers change again has to do with the symmetry. So the first two molecules all have planes of symmetry that go through them and you know, d depending on the structure there may be more or less atoms on either side of that plane. But P-xylene, the one on the far right, has two planes of symmetry that go through it. See if you can find them. You can also do uh, a substitution test, though it's a little bit more complicated than um, for hydrogen. Uh, generally though, two carbon atoms that have hydrogen atoms attached to them that are chemically equivalent, if the hydrogen atoms are chemically equivalent, the carbons they're attached to are also chemically equivalent. A uh, second similarity is the correlation between chemical shift and structure, and it follows similar patterns for similar reasons as uh, hydrogen and MR. It's just again that the a chemical shift range is bigger. So starting at, at the right side of an NMR spectrum with low chemical shifts are your sp3 hybridized carbon atoms that are just decorated with hydrogen atoms and not a lot going on. Between 50 and 100 parts per million you have alkyne carbons and carbons attached to uh, other or electronegative atoms. So your carbons attached to oxygen, nitrogen, bromine, fluorine, etc. Uh, and remember from hydrogen NMR spectroscopy that things that influence the chemical shift are additive. So an alkyne carbon that was also attached to a nitrogen would have a chemical shift higher than either of those two things separately. Between 100 and 150 are those sp2 hybridized carbon atoms that are in alky alkenes and aromatic rings and so the uh, the um, chemical shift or the deshielding that occurs because of pi bonds or pi electrons also impacts the carbons. And then finally, above 150 are those carbon atoms that are parts of carbonyl groups. Uh, they are highly deshielded both by being participating in a pi bond but also being directly bonded to oxygen. And, and as I mentioned, these things are additive. So the um, the chemical shift for you know, an alkene or an aromatic ring carbon that has an oxygen attached to it is going to be closer to 150 than it is to 100. One thing that we can do differently in carbon spectroscopy is something called uh, DEPT, where DEPT stands for Distortionless Enhancement by Polarization Transfer. This is another way to get uh, information about attached hydrogen atoms. The number of hydrogen atoms that are attached to each carbon atom. Um, so instead of doing uh, off resonance decoupling, which would work, uh, depth is a two-dimensional NMR spectroscopy technique, where two dimensions means that you are pumping energy into one nucleus but looking at the energy emitted by another one. So in, in the case of depth we are pumping energy into the hydrogens and seeing what the car and you know, seeing how much it hurts the carbon atoms basically. Um, and depending on the different type of techniques you can get different peak appearances based on the number of hydrogens. So uh, the table below summarizes 
CH3, CH2, CH, and, and C. There's no point in putting up CH4 for, for methane. Um, it's the only molecule that has four hydrogen atoms attached to the same carbon. Um, and so for the off resonance decoupled peaks, you can actually, you would get C, a quartet for CH3, a triplet for CH2, a doublet for CH, and a singlet for, for carbon with no hydrogens. But the more common broadband decoupled, you'd see singlets for, for everything. Um, DEPT90, DEPT90, is a technique that only produces peaks for carbons with one hydrogen atom on them. And it produces a positive peak for those carbon atoms. De DEPT135 is a technique that produces positive peaks for carbons with odd numbers of hydrogens and negative peaks for carbons with even numbers of hydrogens. So CH3 produces a positive peak, CH2 produces a negative peak, and CH produces a positive peak. If we were going to put CH4 on here, uh, CH4 would produce a negative peak in depth 135 and no peak in depth 90. There is another kind of two-dimensional NMR tech called APT, apt, attached proton test. It's a different technique, meaning that the way you tell the instrument to do its business is different, but it provides identical information to depth 135. So here is an example uh, carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy problem. Uh, it's a fairly simple molecule with the formula C4H10O, and we're told that it's an alcohol. There is some full-on determination of structure using carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy, but it really only works for fairly simple molecules like this one. Once the molecule starts to get more complicated, a carbon-13 spectrum is often not enough information on its own. A hydrogen NMR spectrum, an IR spectrum, or some other information is usually necessary to help us put the structure together. But in this particular case, we have enough information to build the structure of this molecule, especially because we have the depth spectra and they can tell us something. So this is a molecule that has three different types of carbon atoms in it, and there are four carbon atoms in its structure. So that means one of these peaks must represent two carbon atoms that are chemically equivalent to each other. And while it's uh, not possible to accurately integrate these peaks, we can at least be suspicious that maybe the tallest peak there at 19 parts per million is, is might represent two carbon atoms. We can also pick out the carbon atom that's respond that has the alcohol attached to it. That's the peak that has a chemical shift up around 69 parts per million because the oxygen atom deshields the carbon. Otherwise, we can use the depth spectra to make some assignments about the multiplicity or, or the number of hydrogen atoms on the structure. So that peak at 30.5 parts per million gives a positive peak both in the depth 90 and the depth 135. And because it shows up in the depth 90, it has to be a CH group. That peak at 69 not only has the alcohol functional group attached to it, but because it gives a negative peak in the depth 135, must be a CH2 group. Finally, that peak at 19 is positive in the depth 135 and missing from the depth 90. So it is a CH3 group. And as we mentioned earlier, because that is the tallest peak in the spectrum, it's possible that there are two CH3 groups in this molecule. And if we work to put together the structure of this molecule, uh, I'm not going to go through that at the moment, but there's only one way that this can work out. And this is the NMR spectrum of the structure that is now shown at the top of the page, 2-methyl-1-propanol or isobutanol. This concludes our discussion of carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy. Thank you for watching.